Welcome to the Martial Arts Psychosis Podcast. Grab some coffee, protein shake or your favorite steroids and enjoy the show. Um, and welcome to the another episode of the Martial Arts Psychosis Podcast. Um, with me today is um, oh my microphone was far away. So yeah, w- with me today is um, Yozo Grgic. Um I don't personally know Yozo. Uh, I think that's about to change. Uh, but um, yeah, he's a researcher uh, from the field of um, kinesiology, and this podcast will probably be a little bit nerdy. Uh, but still, what, bear with us, and I think you'll you'll come up uh, with a lot of knowledge in the end. Yozo, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, let's start. Okay, let's start with a little bit of self introduction. So tell us okay, more cool. about your credentials. Why are you important for um, the field of fitness and and the new knowledge that comes up? Yeah, I wouldn't say important. But yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I'm originally from Bosnia, so I finished my high school here, and then I moved to Croatia, where I finished my master's in kinesiology. And just last year, I moved to Melbourne, where I'm a PhD student in the field of sport and exercise science. Yeah, and been publishing papers for the last couple of years. And yeah, that's that sums it up. Nice. Pretty short. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. So um. Well, first of all, how did you get into into the field of kinesiology and sports science in in general? Huh. So back in high school, I was kind of like a troublemaker, you know, <laughs> fighting all the time. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> not fighting, you know, like um, getting kick, kicked out uh, oh, okay. from from classes and stuff. Uh, so I didn't have much interest in in high school and in learning and stuff, but I always had an interest in in sports. So when I was last year, last year of my high school, I was like thinking, should I go, uh, should I um, go to go to college or maybe get a job or something? So I was looking for colleges yeah, in Croatia, and I saw this faculty of kinesiology. Uh, it was like sports science and stuff. So yeah, like give it a go, and it was like uh, love at first sight, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I really enjoyed five years. Uh, my masters, um, yeah, and that's basically it. You know, it was uh, it was really an awesome period for me. And when I finished it, so I, I wanted to continue my education because I felt like the level of knowledge uh, wasn't that great, you know. Mm-hmm. So I started really reading a lot of science papers and wanted to get into publishing. Mm-hmm. So that's how I started. So okay, awesome. All yeah. right. Um, okay, so right now you're you're studying so you're studying in Australia and yeah. um, you moved there recently. So what what do you like about Melbourne? Mm, I I don't like the weather. Okay, obviously, yeah. I don't like yeah. It's always uh, it has four seasons in one day. They call <laughs> it the city of four seasons. Uh, hmm, that's a really good question, man. I don't know. I like the opportunities for education, you know. Oh, for, for uh, that's sure. Pretty, yeah, yeah. That's 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 a totally different world than in Croatia. You know? Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, sure. So, so, sorry, my my dogs my dogs are barking. Um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so, I I just I just want to make like a little introduction for for our listeners. Uh, what we're planning to talk about today. So mostly we're we'll, we're gonna going to focus on on your research. Um, and how that can be important, not not only for fighters, but for everyone that, that that's trying to achieve any type of fitness goal. Uh, and I th- I think that's uh, that's important because um, in in fitness, I think, and we'll talk a little bit about pseudoscience in fitness as well um, if we get to it. Uh, but but still, um, let's let's start um, with your research interests. Uh, so we, we know, I mean, be, being a researcher and a scientist myself in completely other field, um, so I, we know that, that research can be a lonely and a grueling process. Uh, yeah. So what, what would be your research interests? Let, let's talk about that. 
well, I would say the main interest uh, are, is resistance training mm -hmm. and the adaptations that we have from resistance training, mainly strength and hypertrophy. Uh, the second area would be sports supplements. I did, okay. I did a couple of studies with uh, caffeine. And I also do some some uh, studies with like physical activity stuff, but that's like in the major uh, minority. Okay. Uh, but mainly, yeah, mainly I would say resistance training and strength gains and hypertrophy gains okay. in all age in all age groups, athletes, recreationally active people, and even elderly. You know. Nice. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. So. Um, you, you did some research on on the frequency of training, and yeah. we all know that that athletes um, have have a kind of a problem with that. Um, we we kind of have the feeling, um, especially when I was when I was more active uh, before my injury, um, I always had the mentality more more the the merrier. Like the more you train, yeah. the better you become. And but not necessarily. Like I overtrained a couple of times, and that's not a pleasant feeling. We all know about that. So, what can you tell us about your research on the topic of fre frequency of training and the methodology of your research as well? Yeah. So I did uh, two studies now on frequency of training. Okay. One was a collaboration study with Brad Schoenfeld. I think your listeners will probably have heard of him. Um, so we did a study on we compared the training frequencies of two versus, versus three times per week. Um, I think the sample size was around 30, uh, 30. resistance okay. men. Um, the study was 10 weeks in, in duration. So they measured strength, uh, endurance, and hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the, the study was volume equated. So the number of sets on, on, a, on a weekly basis was the same between groups, OK? So only the distribution of sets uh, differed. So okay. the, uh, one group trained each muscle group two times per week, and the other trained each muscle group three times per week. So basically, after 10 weeks, there was no difference uh, in, in either of the variables. Um, yeah, so really interesting. And we recently did a study. Uh, my colleagues from Croatia did it. They compared frequencies of three uh, times per, per week versus six times per week, also no difference. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we just uh, recently submitted a meta-analysis on the topic. It was on the topic of frequency and strength gains. So basically, we saw a, a dose-response relationship between frequency and strength, meaning the more you, the more you train, you get uh, more strength gains. Okay. But when you equate the volume between groups, there's no difference. So it seems... The volume, basically, the uh, the weekly volume is the primary driver of growth or strength, and the frequency does not play that much of a role as we Holy previously. Holy shit! Who, yeah, yeah. I, I like that's that's amazing because because that yeah. that will that that can impact all of the programming that we're doing, right? So especially yeah. when you're um, when you're um, thinking about the strength programs. Uh, for example, um, five times five, right? Five and five program, the the, the well-known strength program, uh, which is somewhere between strength and hypertrophy, right? So when you, when you, when you, when you think about that, and that program is made to to, um, to work all muscle groups three times per week, right? So yeah. even even if you can sneak in two times per week, there will be virtually no difference, right? Yeah, the the current research does suggest that oh, if you equate yeah. volume. You do basically you can it, it suggests you can train uh, a muscle group only once per week, and uh, I think that's yeah I think that's very common to what bodybuilders do. They train a uh, muscle group once or twice per week. Uh, there was a recent survey of I think 130 bodybuild, bodybuilders, and they all almost all report that uh, they train a muscle group only once or twice per week. Nobody trains a muscle group three times per week. Okay, so, so, yeah. so uh, just just interrupt a little bit. What would that mean for um, what what would that mean for like an average Joe? How many times per week should they go to the gym? Like three times, two times per week is enough. If you're doing like three compound lifts two times per week, you'll still you'll still have gains. Yeah, yeah, you definitely will. Well, I think it it can change your programming. Basically, if if you can train only once per week, if you're like uh, time pressed. 
you can train, I don't know, once per week and do a two-hour session, and it seems like the gains in strength and, and hypertrophy would be roughly the same if, you know. Uh, Holy. Yeah, so I think that's pretty valuable for, for people like who have jobs, who have children, who don't have much time, you know, can, I don't know, train only on the weekend. Uh, well, the, the current research that does suggest, you know, you should do it. If you can only do it once per week, do it once per week, you know. Oh wow! Okay, awesome, man. That's 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 great. Um, I think that, that that's that's a novelty. Where did you publish that? In so, some like reputable reputable journal, right? Yeah. So that meta analysis that I talked about, it's currently under review in Sports Medicine. Uh, that's like the, I think, highest impact journal in in sports science. And the original paper that we compared frequencies of two versus three times per week. Mm -hmm. is currently under review. It's in European Journal of Sports Science, also a really good journal. And the the study on three versus six times per week is not still published, but it's going to be, we're still doing the write-up and the analysis a bit, but it's going to be published in a couple of months. But, yeah. Okay, beautiful, man. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, just thanks. Um, g give, me, give me three and a half seconds here, because... My mom is texting me <laughs> in the middle of a podcast. All right, uh, I'm back. All right, so um, tell me more. Uh, tell me more about your research on rest intervals. Uh, but explain it to me like I'm 12. Uh, how much should I rest and why? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So the rest in intervals are basically the the period between uh, exercises or between sets. It has uh, been uh, often thought that you need to rest for 60 seconds or less in order to to gain muscle muscle mass, you know, because some of the early research, I think, like from 30 or 40 years ago, showed that when you rest for, when you limit the rest inter intervals for one minute, you get a higher uh, spike in growth hormone and testosterone. So we, we logically, like, uh, thought, okay, you get acute increases in growth growth hormone that must be uh, contributing to muscle muscle gains, you know. But some of the uh, more novel research show that the acute changes in, in hormones actually don't contribute to changes in muscle mass. Uh, so the hypothesis that you need to rest for one minute or less does not seem to be uh, logical, so logical anymore. Um, so, based on the more recent, more recent evidence, it seems that um, roughly around two minutes to three minutes would be uh, good for hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. uh, it can vary based on the exercise selection. If you're doing a multi-joint exercise like squats, deadlifts, you probably, sh you know, you need to rest a bit more. Uh, also, if you train to failure, uh, you should probably rest more. Um, but yeah, r roughly around two to three minutes would be good. Uh, if you're doing a single joint exercise like bicep curl or something else, you could probably get away with one minute rest interval. It'll, okay. it'll be fine. Uh, so so it, does it does it also depend on the size of the muscle as well? For example, if you if you're doing like that's that's my common sense. Like if if I'm if I'm uh, doing squats or any or, or like any compound. Compound lifts, obviously, like my my quads will be burning. Those are big muscles, right? And my biceps are kind of small. So does that make, yeah, make yeah. any sense? Yeah, it does depend because when you're doing squats, you're not only working your quads, you're working your upper body as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so the more fatigue you get during the set, the more rest you need. It's pretty logical, yeah, I think. Yeah. And, and yeah, when you're working your biceps or you're working your calves or something, a small muscle group, uh, you can get away with 30 seconds or a minute, probably be fine. Uh, so we suggest that you combine both, both, both strategies, like uh, longer intervals and shorter mm -hmm. in your training. Uh, you get some benefit from both. Okay, yeah. awesome. All right, and um, just let me let me have a look here at my structure, because um, yeah. So let's let's talk about. Let's talk about your research on muscle mass. So to me, it seems that like 
muscle mass um, has been the, the holy grail of fitness, the, 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 the El Dorado of, so, uh, of, of its own sort for, for bodybuilders. Um, so b before we even start talking about your research on the topic of muscle mass, yeah. um, w why do you think people in general uh, praise muscle mass so much? Because they want to be jacked. I want to be jacked. <laughs> I want to be as jacked as possible. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. Like, uh, I, I mean, but being, being jacked and just having too much muscle mass is, is completely different. And, like, be, being a trainer for, for a long time and being a fighter as well, um, I, I, I truly do get pissed when I'm talking about this. Um, but I, I've had amateur bodybuilders come into my gym. And they turned out to be anti-athletes. You can never teach them how to box. It's it's almost like they 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 messed up their their capabilities forever. And um, yeah, I I don't. Why do you why do you think we we praise muscle mass so much culturally? I don't know. I think it's like it's probably a sign of an alpha male. You know, if you're big, muscular, you have dominance in the in society. So I'm guessing yeah. that could be the reason. You're probably looking at it from a different perspective, you know. You're looking uh, from a perspective of a fighter. Yeah. You want to be as fast, as strong as possible. You don't need to be jacked. I mean, you can be jacked, but you don't need to be. It's, it's just a consequence. Yeah. 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 Just, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I kind of I kind of feel like that. Um, the, the, the thing about it, we, we always think that um, strength necessarily means you're dominant in physical confrontation but being a fighter yeah. you know that's not the only variable that contributes to, to you being dominant in the physical confrontation um actually if, if you go to if you go to thailand and if you ever had experience so i'll just i'll just uh, tell you a little bit more about my experience so i i had the opportunity to spar with a guy i was still a kid i was like 17 or 18 so um, there was a guy that came to our gym as a guest and the guy, like, he was even shorter than me, which is not that hard. I'm pretty short. <laughs> so the guy had a little belly, and he had uh, pink shorts with a panda on them. Like, okay. the, with a character panda on them. And we're like, like, who the fuck is that guy? And he had some white gloves. And then he was like, hey, man, do, would you like to spar? And me, incapable of saying no to a fight, especially back then, I was like, yeah, for sure. Let's, let, let, let's, let's spar. And... When that guy started busting me up, man, that was – people were just looking like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I, I know firsthand that, that, fight, that fight, um, fighting skills do not necessarily uh, correlate to strength. Can it help? For sure. But it can also be it can also be a, a draining factor, as it was yesterday, for example, for Francis Nagano when fighting Stipe. Like his his muscle mass and his strength were a d d the path to to his defeat. Um, okay, so tell me more about your research on on volume of training and its effects on on muscle mass. Yeah, so I didn't do much research on volume. Okay. Um, I'm currently involved in a collaboration project with Brad. Brad Schoenfeld, mm -hmm. so he's doing a um, dose response study between resistance training volume and hypertrophy. Uh, so it's a, this is an often debate in the fit fitness industry. So uh, are multiple sets really better than single sets? So there are basically two groups. One suggests like single set to failure. It's all that's all you need, and the other one is suggesting like multiple sets are needed for for growth. So um, he, he did a recent meta-analysis on the topic and showed that like uh, 10 sets per week per muscle group would, be, would probably be uh, a minimum dose that you, mm -hmm. that, that you need for, for maximizing muscle, muscle gains. But the large portion of the current studies are in untrained individuals. So you can get growth. Um, it's pretty easy to get grow, growth uh, if you're untrained. So he's currently doing a dose response uh, in trained individuals. Um, I think the there are basically three levels of volume, a low, a moderate, and a high volume group. The low group is doing around five sets per, per week. The moderate around 10 or 15. And 
the high uh, volume group is doing around 30 sets per muscle per week. And based on some preliminary da data that we have, it definitely seems that there is a dose response relationship between, between resistance training volume and uh, gains in hypertrophy. But for strength, it doesn't seem to be, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be the same. You need, you don't need as much volume uh, for strength gains. Uh, Obviously. But it's still pre preliminary, so we'll mm -hmm. see uh, when the data collection is finished. But yeah, uh, so there, there is definitely a, a dose response relationship between uh, volume, set volume, and growth. So the more you do, the, the more gains you have. Okay, all right. Uh, so there is there is no type of like optimum minimum uh, amount of dosage for now. You, can you can you maybe answer that? No, you can you can definitely get gains if you do one set uh, if you do one set per exercise to failure. You can definitely get gains, especially if you're untrained. Mm -hmm. uh, but you get uh, you you basically uh, adapt to the to the level of volume. And you just need to increase it, you know. Um, so you can definitely get gains in uh, doing five sets per week per muscle uh, per muscle group. Uh, but in order to continue getting gains, you know, okay. uh, you need to you need to increase the volume over time. All right. You can combine you can combine both approaches. You can do a vo low volume routine for a couple of weeks and then do a high volume. You basically periodize the the training but yeah all right so uh you you touched right now on on the say the, the the another subject i wanted to talk about with you and that's the subject of um periodization of training so uh what's your research on that and do we need to do we need to do that at all so what, what's your take on it yeah that's a really interesting topic and very controversial mm -hmm. uh so we previously thought that you need to period, periodize your training, and it's, uh, it's basically from the Russian sports science uh, literature back in the 60s. Uh, the, the models, block periodization, linear uh, undulating and stuff. So, <clears throat> but we did uh, two reviews on, on that topic. One was a meta-analysis where we compared a linear model and a undulating model. Uh, there was no difference between uh, between the, the two models. Um, can can, and we you, did can also you explain the models first, please? Yeah, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. So a undulating mod model is where you basically work in different rep ranges uh, uh, in during the training week. So on Monday you maybe do uh, fives. On Wednesday you do. 15 reps, and on Friday you do 30, and you basically undulate the repetitions and volume. And a linear model is where you gradually increase the intensity, increase the load, and decrease the volume. Mm -hmm. okay. time. Yeah, so those are the two basic uh, periodization models. Uh, yeah, as I said, we did a meta analysis on the topic of uh, periodiz periodization models and hypertrophy. We also included only volume equated studies, so studies that had two groups. One did a linear model, the other one did a undulating model, but they equated the, the total volume. There was no difference between uh, between the two models. And more recently, we did a review on comparing any periodization model to ba to a basic non-periodized model. So where you do the uh, where you do uh, each training session, you do the same routine. You know, you mm -hmm. you do three sets of ten each training session. So, based on our uh, review of the literature, it does not seem that you need to do a per any periodization model. You can get gains, uh, equal gains uh, with a non-periodized model. But that said, most of the studies are very short. They're like eight weeks, ten weeks. Uh, so periodization is thought of uh, as a long-term concept like a yearly model model and so yeah uh, the studies will not answer everything uh sure. these studies are mo most commonly done like in college aged men uh and they last one semester like 12 weeks yeah so yeah the studies are very short so it's kind of hard to uh to answer the question with the current body of evidence you will need to do a one-year study where one group is doing a non-periodized model 
and the other group is doing, I don't know, a linear model and to see if there is a, a truly effect, but you, you will never get a study like that. Yeah, for sure. But what I'm interested in uh, is how do you control for other intervening variables in those studies? Uh, for example, guys that are juiced up with testosterone and whatnot uh, will obviously have more gains regardless of the, uh, regardless of the yeah. period. So how do you control for that? Yeah, but most commonly you, you don't get people on, on roids in studies. Uh, okay. you, you most commonly get untrained college, college age men. Oh, so you screen like, like that, right? Yeah, you're screening like that. Okay. You set a criteria. I don't know, no experience in resistance training, no use of anabolics. I don't know, no stuff like that. So you screen that, screen them before. Um, and yeah, if they meet the inclusion criteria, then they do the study okay. and that's it. All right. But yeah, but like yeah. If, if they decided to take roids uh, in the middle of the study, you would just see like their, their, like their gains would be off the charts, right? Obviously, there yeah. you would be like, man, <laughs> it's it's obvious you're yeah. taking something. Yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't control for that. There, yeah, it's impossible. It is. It is impossible. But yeah, uh, when we're on, yeah. Yeah. When we're on that topic, I would like just like to mention a study done. Uh, it was done, I think, twenty two years ago or twenty three years ago. Uh, so the study had, I think it was three groups. So one group, uh, one group trained. So okay, yeah, okay. Uh, there were three three groups. Okay. So one group received, I think it was 500 milligrams of testosterone per week, and they did not train with resistance. The other group trained with resistance. But they did not receive uh, testosterone. Okay. I think it was only two groups. So after I think it was twelve weeks, the group that did not train but received uh, five hundred milligrams of testosterone increased strength like by fifteen kilos, increased uh, muscle mass by three kilos, and the group that did not receive testosterone but did train, I think they increased strength like by ten kilos and muscle mass by one kilo or something. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. It's yeah, that, huge. that was really a, that was a really great study. It was published in New England Journal New England Journal of Medicine. That's like the the top among the top five journals in the world in all fields, not only wow. in sports. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that only show, shows you how uh, powerful steroids really are. Oh yeah. But there's there's not a lot of studies like that. You know, that's one one of a kind. Yeah, but like you you don't even you don't even have to. It's it's enough that that I don't know for for fighters especially. I sparred with a guy that I didn't know was on testosterone, and the amount of strength like he was my weight, maybe a little bit heavier than I was. The amount of strength that guy can produce, it's, yeah. it's just like you. It's impossible to do anything. Like even even the um, I think I had uh, an arm bar like I was holding an arm bar and the guy literally lift, lifted me off the ground like I was nothing, just slammed me on the ground and I was like holy shit, and yeah. like it's 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 but people people don't understand um, how how big of a difference they they make. I don't know if you had a chance to watch a documentary called Icarus on Netflix. No. No, why, well, definitely my recommendation. It's about the um, Russian Olympic scandal. So it, okay. it, it's, it, it starts as a, as a story of a cyclist who just wanted to use steroids in order um, to increase his performance. He's like semi, semi-professional slash amateur cyclist. And mm-hmm. then he gets in contact with this Russian scientist who, um, who decides to disclose the whole Russian steroid scandal with the Olympics. Okay. Boom, and the story starts. It, it's about two to two or three hours long. It's I, I was like watching it with my jaw open. I was like, "What the fuck?" And it was yeah. it was awesome. Uh, so yeah. So what what do you think? Like we have that fitness trend going on since we're talking about steroids. That's always an interesting subject. So yeah. we we have that that fitness trend, and I'm especially here in Canada. I'm just looking at amateur bodybuilders. Like the guy is fifty, but he's jacked. <laughs> he's just jacked. Like he doesn't have a gram of body fat on his body. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, like they're all obviously used. You can't look like that when you're fifty or whatever. Yeah. Like, naturally, you can't. Your testosterone is declining. And what do you what do you think about that? 
I don't know. I think like people, it's in our nature to get the. We want the the. I would say the easy way out, probably. You know, because. Um, yeah, a lot of people just want to make gains and make fast gains. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's probably the main reason. Just you know, I just want to do the do it the the easy way out, and a lot of people are not thinking long term. And to be honest, we don't know the long term uh, consequences Effects. of yeah. Their, yeah, we don't because there 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 are not studies like where we follow people for ten years who are using roids to see what really happens. So yeah, there's only anecdotal evidence. Yeah, so, yeah, but it, it, it's an interesting topic. Uh, we I, I don't think we know a lot about steroids, but yeah, I think more and more people are are starting to use it, especially with the the social media, with uh, Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I, I think the the I think the standards of beauty and standards of looks uh, trans yeah. are, are slowly but steadily. Um, I wouldn't say transferring, but um, sp it's it's a spillover of, of cultural standards from um, female like for, from from female magazines where uh, Cosmopolitan and what whatnot where you could see like female models they were all looking beautiful uh, yep. and now I think the same pressure can be I mean it, it it can be said that the same pressure is applied to to guys as well uh, yeah yeah so I, yeah I definitely agree if you if you see some of the the action figures back in the seventies and eighties. The action heroes were not as jacked. They were like uh, regular people, you know, like mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. yeah. And when you see like action figures and superheroes in uh, today, they're, like tremendously jacked. They're like bodybuilders, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So yeah, when you grow up, you see that that it's a it's a model that you aspire to be, and I think that that can definitely have an impact. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, but do you think we can use steroids responsibly? And in a healthy way? Oof. Probably. I would say yeah, probably. I, th I think so, too. I think so, too. Yeah, I like, um, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm 30. My testosterone is not declining and will not decline anytime soon. Uh, but I do have yeah. a low testosterone. Uh, yeah. I, like, I, 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 did, I did my test and I do have a low testosterone. I was always thinking, like, why wouldn't I take just a little bit? <laughs> you know, yeah. Just a little bit? Why, why wouldn't I be, like, more, more energetic, more jacked? And stuff like that, but I didn't. I I, st I still haven't. Uh, but I'm still thinking about it, though. <laughs> yeah, I think when you get like fifty or something, you get re your testosterone do does get a really low. So maybe I don't know. Maybe supplementing with testosterone would be, would be good. But yeah. I don't know. It's yeah, it's kind of out of my area of ex expertise. So. Oh, I'm yeah. not talking. I'm not talking from the standpoint of expertise. I'm talking about like, yeah. do you want to be jacked? <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. that's 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 kind of my my take on it. All right. Um, and tell me more. Um, so we were talking a little bit about a uh, volume of uh, of training. Uh, so what what would you say, like high reps or low reps? Yeah, that that's really interesting topic. Uh, so pre previously, like ten years ago, we thought you need to do like six to twelve reps to failure for growth. Mm -hmm. But some of recent evidence uh, suggested that even if you do like thirty reps or forty reps, you get equal growth uh, when compared with like six to twelve reps. So we we re recently did a recently did a meta analysis on the topic, uh, Brad led the project. It was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. You can find it online. Mm -hmm. uh, so we basically compared high load uh, training, high load, uh, low rep to low load, high rep training. So for uh, for muscle growth, for hypertrophy, there's no difference. Oh, so wow. you can do, yeah, you can do 20, 30 reps uh, or you can do six to 12 reps. If you hit failure, it, it definitely seems that you get equal growth. Uh, so there's there's some emerging evidence from Russia suggesting that. So you basically have two types of muscle mus muscle fibers in your body. There's type one and type two. Uh, so sprinters have a lot of type two fibers, and marathon runners have a lot of type one fibers. So there's some evidence from Russia suggesting that when you do high rep training, 
you get more growth of type 1 fibers. They're like your endur endurance type fibers. And when you do high load training, you get more growth of type 2 fibers. Okay. So our, our suggestion would be to combine both. So do both high, high rep and low rep. Uh, it could possibly be linked with exercise selection. So if you're doing an isolation exercise, if you're doing a bicep curl, you can probably get, you, it'll be much more easier to do 30 reps than doing it on a squat. Mm -hmm. It'd be much, much, much less fatiguing. So yeah, our initial, our current, uh, well, actually my current uh, standpoint uh, on the topic is to combine both high reps mm -hmm. and low reps. Okay, all for, right. Yeah, for strength gains, it seems you need to be uh, doing high load training. You need to okay. be doing, yeah, from one to five reps, one to 10 reps, you definitely need to be in that uh, that high, high load zone. Yeah, because there's no neural adaptation of that sort, right? If, if you're doing high reps. Yeah, it's, well, it's basically, uh, it's, it, it's linked with the principle of specificity. Okay. So when you test strength, you do a one RM, okay? You, yep. that the, the maximal weight that you can lift in, let's say a bench press. Okay. So if you have two groups, one group is doing high load training, let's say doing five, uh, five sets of five, and the other group is doing five sets of 30. If you test them on a one RM pre and post study, it makes sense that the group training uh, with high loads would have more strength gains because they are practicing, practicing exactly. their, yeah. So exactly. so if you are a power lifter, if, you are do, if your so, uh, sole goal is to lift for one rep, one rep, uh, it definitely seems that you need to work in that uh, in that uh, one to five rep zone. You definitely need to practice your competition uh, skill, ba basically your competition skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you get high, when you do high load training, you're not practicing as much. You know, you're you're doing something completely different. You're doing 30 reps, and you're testing in in one RM. So it's it's much more different. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You get you get you get strength strength gains even when doing 30 reps, but they they are la larger when you're doing uh, high load training. Oh wow! Yeah, so, that's yeah, the, the... strength. For strength, you need to do high load high load training. That's that 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 that, that totally makes sense. Yeah, uh, it totally makes sense. But uh, yeah, it's it's damn your research is interesting, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Yeah. All right, um, what's what's your what are your um yeah actually you did some research on caffeine right and the effects of caffeine on training yeah so tell us more about that that's interesting yeah that was a project from last year that was a really really fascinating study to me caffeine is is like it, it's so powerful you know it, it can it, it can be so powerful for exercise and we use it uh each day, I'm a I'm I'm a high coffee drinker. So who isn't? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we did. Uh, it was like a it was a double blind study. It was a crossover trial. So we had 17 uh, trained men. They did a placebo trial. So they received uh, basically a dose without a caffeine, and we had a caffeine trial where they got six milligrams of caffeine per kilogram. Which, which is a pretty high dose. Uh, so we tested them in the 1RM back squat and bench press. We did uh, vert vertical jumping and medicine ball throws. And we did muscular endurance, like uh, as many reps you can with 60% of 1RM. So yeah, the, the results were really interesting. Uh, it, they showed that when you ingest caffeine uh, prior to exercise, you you can definitely enhance your 1RM. The increase was uh, around 3%. Um, and you can enhance your power production. So the, the there was an increase in upper body power, medicine ball throws. Uh, so we also assessed the uh, rate of perceived exertion and pain perception. So we used two scales. After each exercise, we asked the participants to indicate their uh, subjective response 
and there, with the caffeine trial there was uh, there was a lower lower value in the rate of perceived exertion and pain perception mm -hmm. so when you consume caffeine you definitely can enhance performance and it seems that you can reduce your rate of perceived exertion and pain which which probably helps you to perform better mm -hmm. uh, so we cur currently have a, a larger, we only had 17 trained men uh, in our study. So a colleague of mine is doing his PhD on, on this topic. So we are currently in, in the process of study design and we're going to have 40, 40 trained men and we're going to look at several different things. So I think that we're going to probably publish a couple of studies from that, uh, from that group. So it's going to be interesting. Oh, wow. So... Yeah. Um how did you how did you select those specific exercises why did you select those exercises so previous research has shown that caffeine does not increase 1rm okay mm -hmm. so i read through those studies and they mostly used leg press for the 1rm assessment okay so there, there's a lot of uh, when you when you test something it's important to have tests with a uh, low error okay when you do a leg press, uh, it can have a large error of measurement. It can be why, just why is that random error because you uh, an, an average Joe can lift maybe I don't know 100 kilos in the back squat one okay. rm, but in the leg press you can lift I don't know 300 kilos or three, yeah. 350. It's, it's way so easier. It, yeah, the the higher the values you get uh, in a test the higher the error most commonly you know mm -hmm. okay so so i read through those studies and i'm like thinking i think that caffeine can have an effect but the performance test that they used were, ju were not a good choice they you mm -hmm. know who, who does a one rm on, on a leg press yeah Do you ever, yeah <laughs> yes. nobody does it you know hello the 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 squat exercise and yeah uh Okay, that, so that can, can you can you can you repeat the ra the last sentence because you were uh, you you were breaking up a little bit. So at, what what did you say after who does the la who does the one rep maximum on the leg press? What did you say after that? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I was reading th through those studies and I'm like thinking nobody does a one RM on a on a leg mm -hmm. press. So let's do a study uh, that will test one RM on, on the squat. You know, people do one RM on the squat very very often. So that that was the main rationale. Be, uh, for the exercise selection okay all right so yeah. what about medicine ball throw how did you choose that that's interesting to me uh yeah we wanted to test power uh we wanted to test both upper and lower body power for lo lower body power we used vertical jumps and medicine ball throws we use them basically because they're very cheap okay we had, we had no funding for our study uh, obviously was... like 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 it's Sometimes the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. Uh, sorry, sorry about it. <laughs> All good. Don't worry about yeah. it. It's a podcast, yeah. buddy. Relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, we funded the study ourselves. So for the medicine ball throw, we just needed a bench and a medicine. I think ball that was nine kilos or something like that. So that that's the main reason. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, what do you think? I mean, we, we're kind of um, getting to, to the end of, of this uh, nerdy phase. So I, w I would just like to ask, what, what's your, so in the past 10 or 15 years, we have like a huge explosion of fitness as a trend. And it's mostly yeah. focused on aesthetics and people trained to look good, not necessarily to be healthy, not necessarily to perform better. Uh, so what, 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 what's your take on that? How do, you, how do you see fitness trend right now? How do you see it developing further? Well, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. I think it's going to probably stay the same for for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. People just want to be, just want to look good. Uh, they don't really care about health long term. So yeah, as we as we talked about it previously, I think it's it, it, the the social media, the world that we live in, has definitely influenced that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. As a researcher, I'm interested in both in the in the health benefits, but also in the aesthetic benefits. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's probably going to stay like this for a couple of years. I'm not sure what would need to happen to change that. 
yeah all right okay all right guys um so unfortunately this podcast had to end um the the thing is the skype connection was not very stable and since i'm pretty new at this i didn't know how to compensate i didn't prepare for it basically so next time hopefully um i'll be better prepared for uh the the upcoming unfortunate circumstances um but i i hope this podcast provided something for everyone, um, especially if you're into fitness, which is probably the reason why I'm listening to my podcast in the first place. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you learned something. I did, for sure. And hopefully we'll have Yozo again um, once he he finishes his, his upcoming projects and um, he can kind of talk about his, his, his new uh, findings uh, again here with us. So... The next guest in our podcast is the one and only um, Dominic Akuma Zidov. He is well known, um, especially for us who, who follow Muay Thai. And um, he was one of the uh, competitors of the TV show The Contender Asia. And he lost against uh, one and only John Wayne Parr. So uh, hopefully he'll tell us something about um, his, life in, his life in Thailand uh, how he made the decision, how he prepares for a fight, for his fights, and I mean he's not fighting anymore, but still. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Tune in, stay with us, subscribe, like us on Facebook, whatever you have to do. Um, but until then, stay strong. Thanks, guys, and sorry about this once again. My it was it was completely my mistake. Sorry. Okay, cool. Bye.